day two. All right, everyone. Welcome back, as the YouTubers say to their audience all the time. Made a video about my first day that I, and how I, that looks like in school. And if you haven't checked that out, I, I, that might be a good move to check that one out first. And I'm gonna put that link up here so that if you wanna check that out, you can. This is what I do on my second day of school every year. So on the second day, the first thing that I do when everyone walks into my room after I've shaken their hand at the door again, because that's what I do, I'm going to put kids in a seating order. And most kids hate this, right? But it makes it easier for me because I can already, I have my seating chart made up already. And now this just in, Mr. Reynolds' Guide to Seating Children. So here's the get down on why I do my seating chart the way that I do. First of all, I do rows. And I do rows for a couple of different reasons. But I'll say first that rows in my optimal teaching experience would not be the way to go. I don't like the formality of it. I don't like the rigidity of it. I don't like the fact that it looks like, makes my classroom look like a classroom from the 1950s. But I've learned that the students are more used to rows. And so I start my year off with rows and with assigned seating. And that changes, and I'll get into that in a second. And the way that I do that is, one, I seat you alphabetically in the beginning of the year because it makes it easier for me to have a sense of who you are and where you're supposed to be. And when I'm handing out paperwork in the beginning of the year, it's a lot easier. And so even the way I set up my seating chart looks like this. So let me see if I can adequately explain this. When I have my seating chart, and I realize this is hard to see, the child that sits right here in the front is sitting in that desk right there. The child that sits in the seat behind him is right there. So when I'm looking at my seating chart, I can actually see in front of me who's supposed to be there. Now this makes a couple of things easier. Alphabetized students are a lot easier to organize for than kids that just sit wherever they want. Never be 100% certain that your seating chart will stay that way for the rest of the year. Kids are gonna move. Kids are gonna sit next to their brother or their cousin. You're gonna realize that someone shouldn't sit near a certain group of people. And so it's always fluid, but for that first day, I like to show that I'm in order, that I know your name, that I know where you're supposed to sit, and then all the adequate paperwork, like I said, can get handed out. It also allows me to do attendance way faster than I would otherwise. I never have to call a child's name. If you are not in the correct seat if there is a gap I just know that that child gets an A next to his name and an L if you're late then I don't have to sit here and go Mr. Hall is Mr. Hall here Mr. Hall anywhere anywhere Mr. Hall's not paying attention or he's in the hallway or whatever because they're children and because they are not always paying attention sometimes someone is out of their seat or they're in the wrong seat at the beginning of class and I have a couple of choices there. My general rule is that you lose a point for the day if you're not in your seat when the bell rings. And what that does is it stops the pandemonium of everyone trying to run to their seat before the bell rings. But if you know a student or you see that they were being helped or they were working on something with someone else, you can have some grace for students, but that's at your discretion. But my general rule is you're not in the seat, you're making me write something on my paper I don't wanna write, now you lose a point for the day. Bam! And sometimes I just say they lose a point and they don't really lose anything because who has time for all that? This is not an easy video to shoot, but here's how I do it. If you put kids in alphabetical order, you're gonna go A, B, C, D. Then you're not gonna come back up to the front. Instead, you're gonna go A, B, C, D, E in the back of the classroom right there, F, G, H. What that's gonna allow you to do is smoothly move around the room, up and down the aisles and not have to come back up to the front every time you have that next kid, which is dangerous in itself because there's book bags all over the place, kids long legs sticking out, you're gonna trip, fall. Couple more quick tips, and this, this is a great one. And I think I stole it from Pinterest or something, so I didn't come up with this. I number all of the desks. So this desk is number one, then number two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And what that allows you to do is when students start moving, instead of alphabetizing their names, you have them in number order. And every time this student hands in a paper, they write a number one on the top. That student writes a number two. So then when you wanna organize the papers, you can organize them and then hand them back way faster because you're not running from a student over here to a student over here to a student back here to a student up here. You can just snake through the room and it's much easier to hand things out. The other thing, which looks a little bit disgusting because it's the end of the year, but 
I have lines on my floor that I made with duct tape and then after a while you just pull that duct tape up and guess what? It looks all disgusting and gross, but whatever. The lines let the students know where their desks should be. So if my room gets chaotic, if we do a project, if we do something where we move all the desks out because we're gonna act something out in the classroom. So whenever any kind of madness is going on and I need the kids to put their desks back, one, they're already numbered and two, there are lines on the floor to let them know where the desks should go so that my aisles don't end up like two feet to the left or something like that. Now back to our show. All right, so after I get that seating chart situation out of the way, I go over the syllabus. Syllabus is real easy. Let's, uh, let's throw that up here. So my syllabus looks a little bit different than a lot of other syllabuses. Syllabi, syllabuses, syllabuses. I didn't make this myself, I found it on Pinterest. And I like this because it's not the regular form that most teachers give. Now I have friends that have a seven page syllabus for their classroom. And if that's what you get into, then that's what you get into. I'm not trying to like judge someone or tell them that they're doing it wrong. This is just how I like doing it. And I like setting my class up as something that's going to be slightly different than what you're used to. So I have this one page syllabus. The reason for that is I think that kids can only retain so much information. And if we have seven, eight, nine, ten classes a day, and you have all these different syllabi coming in and all this different information, it's gonna be harder to retain. So I, my feeling is, my sense is that if I can make it a little bit more interesting to look at, then maybe you'll remember some of the things you're looking at. And if not, it's like a one quick page reference back to what is important in my class. So first, I have one rule in my class, that is give respect, get respect. And that might seem corny and it's like, in, I don't know, age old expression or something like that, but it's really the truth. As I said in the first video, I don't have to have a lot of rules because I expect that you were raised not by wolves, although I'm not trying to diss as usual, anyone that has been raised by wolves. Mowgli turned out, well, I don't think he was raised by wolves. He was raised by bears and apes and it was that snake. He wasn't in a good situation. Anyway, give respect, get respect. I shake your hand every day at my door to show you that I respect you. You come in and if you respect me, I respect you. If you don't, I don't like to try and appear as a tough guy. Do not mistake my kindness for weakness because you are mistaken. I've been doing this too long. And to be honest, my sarcasm skills are way sharper than yours are. On this syllabus, it says that I have a Facebook group. I'm not gonna use that this year again. I'm gonna try and do something different because I'm finding that like a lot of the parents aren't on Facebook anymore. So what I try to do is not create something that I want people to go to. I try and find something where, a place where folks already are. So one year I had a Twitter account. I tweeted the homework or tweeted class announcements. One year I had an Instagram account. I've used a bunch of different apps before to try and convey information to folks. So. I have to really think about what I wanna do this year, but I usually use some sort of social media, some sort of way for folks to just use their phone so that they can see what's going down in the class that day. Class supply, supplies, I keep real simple. I used to do a three ring binder. I used to do notebook checks. I used to have it set up a very particular way. And I've gotten away from that for any number of reasons. But mainly the kids have so much stuff they carry around in their backpack and our lockers at our school are about this big. And after you put your giant winter jacket in there, there's really not a whole lot of room for other stuff. So I keep most things in my room and there's gonna be a whole video about that, about how I organize my classroom. And I really limit the amount of supplies that I need you to get. So it's just 300 note cards. Those are four vocabulary words that we'll get later in the year. Blue or black pen, I do not accept red ink. I don't care if you write in purple or orange or whatever. You just can't write in red because I grade in red and it gets tricky to see what I'm writing on there and what I'm grading and it just is a pain. And I don't care if you write in pencil also. You have to have a bound composition book, like one of those old school ones with the, with the marble cover and the bound edge. The reason I use those is because then kids don't rip paper out of them for other things. If you try and rip a piece of paper out of there, it's like trying to like neatly rip toilet paper in half. It just doesn't work well. And a two pocket folder, just so that you know what's coming back to class and what's leaving class. I have a quick little announcement on there that says that you're responsible for any reading materials that you take home. Although most classes, I don't send stuff home with them. I like to do all of my work in class during class time because I don't like homework. Which the irony of that is that my homework policy says that I give homework frequently. And although I, I, there is vocab work to do at home, I don't give a whole lot of reading at home. And the reason for that is because my students have school from eight 
to four every day. And until this year, they, the freshmen had mandatory after school programs till five. So you have kids that are coming to school from eight to five, and then some students that have football after school and then have to travel an hour to an hour and a half by public transportation to get home. If you're not getting home until eight o'clock, if you've been gone for more than 12 hours from your home, the idea of me giving you homework so that you have to work even harder when you get home just seems stupid. I'd much rather you take a breather, spend time with your family, play video games, chill with your friends, go outside and play basketball. That is my take on it. There are plenty of other teachers that give homework, so it's not like kids are going home with no homework, but in my class, I know that it rarely gets done and it's just not worth the battle for me because I'd rather you have the downtime and then work hard while you're in class. And my homework kind of lateness policy is that if you do have homework, I do not take it late unless there's some valid excuse. Like you were in the hospital, your house was on fire, Game of Thrones was on. Those are like really the only three things that you could get away with. Cause I don't like lateness. And so that's how I get down. I don't do makeup work. If you were absent, you have that many days to make up the work. So if you're absent one day, I give you one day to make up the work. Now there's some moving parts in that because if, if someone's grandmother died and they got, they were out for two days and they got a whole bunch of work from other teachers, just come talk to me about it. We'll figure it out. We'll figure out a day. You're not gonna get away with anything, but I don't want you to feel too burdened either. I mean, we're talking about 14 year olds here. They're not not like college students yet. And I think it's just a really great lesson to kids in empathy and grace. And then on that second day, I do two more things. One, I give you a due date so that you know when your supplies are due, which if freshmen come back on a Wednesday, I'll usually make it that following Monday. And you have to tell me in advance if your folks just can't get it yet because they're waiting for payday and like, you know, if someone has a bunch of kids and they just have a lot of school supplies to buy, just let me know. And if there's some sort of financial hardship, you don't have to tell me about it, but just be like, yo, Reynolds, do you have a notebook I could get from you? I'll hook it up, but you have to ask me in advance, not the day of, because then I just think you're lying. Don't like liars. And the last thing we do is, even though you wrote a letter to yourself on the first day, I don't look at those letters. They get sealed up, I write your name on them, they go into an envelope on my desk for the next four sometimes five years. So I ask you to fill out a questionnaire. Found this John on Pinterest also. So uh, let's pop this up there too. And it just asks you things like, what's your full name? What hobbies do you do? When's your birthday? Who's in your family? What's an accomplishment you're proud of? What's your favorite music? What's your favorite TV show? What's your favorite food or movie? And then I actually read these. So when the kids say, we just did this in the last three classes, I don't care because I'm going to actually read them. And I'm not saying all those other teachers don't, but they might not. They might just think that it's a good idea in the beginning. This is going to allow me to see a couple of things. One, your attention to detail. Two, do you pay attention to the questions? There's some tricky words on there. So can you read the trickier words or are you going to have a question about them? Four, what's your handwriting look like? Is it nice or does it look like you're having seizure on the back of a bus on a bumpy road? And five, it puts me in the know for a number of things that kids might not willingly share out loud, but if I just ask them on a sheet of paper, they don't mind writing it down. And if they don't have time to finish that, that is their first piece of homework. It is due the next day without exemption. And what that's gonna allow me to do is on that third day of school, when someone doesn't bring something in, it's 100% a zero the first time, because bro, I was asking you questions about yourself. You already knew all the answers. You didn't even have to look them up. And it lets kids know how real it's gonna be in here and that I, when I say something, I 100% mean it. And that's it for the second day. It's that easy. So if you can see what we're doing here is there's nothing taxing yet. Class is still fun. It's interesting. I'm only asking you things that you know about and I'm trying to set the stage for what the year is going to look like. It's also giving me a chance to have kids work quietly at their desks so I can see who's clowning around, who shouldn't sit next to one another, who needs to, uh, to be at a stand-up desk, who needs room to move and to walk around and stuff like that. It's giving me time to just step back and take a look and see kind of where everyone is. And that's it, day numero dos. I'm gonna ask the same thing I asked about day one. What do you do on the second day, right? Like what are things that have worked, things that haven't worked? And for new teachers, what are you thinking about? What are you nervous about? What are you excited about? What are you thinking about trying? And then I implore some of you that are watching this video to just go through the comments real quick. Answer one or two comments and like holler at somebody that thinks that they're alone and let them know that they're not. And that's it everybody, peace.